Aloha, and welcome back to Lesson 20 of Acts Bible Study, brought to you by Waikea Baptist Bible Church in Hilo, Hawaii. Today we're going to uh, look at Acts chapter 20. Uh, I don't know about you, but after continuing to read the book of Acts, I am just overwhelmed by the faithfulness of Paul as he continues his missionary journeys. He's now on his third missionary journey, as you know, and as we come into Acts 20, he's on his way to uh, Macedonia, and let's begin reading together in Acts 20, beginning in verse 1. When the uproar had ended, Paul sent for the disciples, and after encouraging them, said goodbye and set out for Macedonia. He traveled throughout the area, speaking many words of encouragement to the people, and finally arrived in Greece, where he stayed three months because some Jews had plotted against him just as he was about to sail for Syria. He decided to go back through Macedonia. He was accompanied by Soapater, son of Pyrrhus from Berea, Aristarchus, and Secundus from Thessalonica, Gaius from Derby, Timothy also, and Tychius and Trophimus from the province of Asia. These men went on ahead and waited for us at Troas. But when we sailed from Philippi after the festival of unleavened bread, and five days later joined the others at Troas where we stayed seven days. Did you notice? Uh, that last verse that I read there that he said, where we stayed seven days. Well, evidently now we learned that Luke is now back with the missionary team. Uh, so now continuing on uh, in verse 7, on the first day of the week we came together to break bread. Paul spoke to the people and because he intended to leave the next day, kept on talking until midnight. There were many lamps in the upstairs room when we were meeting. Seated in a window was a young man named Eutychus, who was sinking into a deep sleep as Paul talked on and on. When he was sound asleep, he fell to the ground from the third story and was picked up dead. Paul went down, threw himself on the young man, and put his arms around him. Don't be alarmed, he said. He's alive. Then he went upstairs again and broke bread and ate. After talking until daylight, he left. The people took the young man home alive and were greatly comforted. I guess so. What an event. So he had the meeting with the people at Troas. And, uh, and Paul Barclay explains, I put this in the note, that when members of the early church came together to break bread, they typically had what most of us would be known as a uh, potluck dinner and might be one of the better meals that they had all week because they considered it a love feast. And the Lord's Supper was observed during or immediately uh, after the love feast. And so what a wonderful way, as I have in the notes, to have fellowship with fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Well, Paul goes on and uh, he says uh, um, farewell to the Ephesian elders. Um, let's pick this up. Um, and the reason is Paul is heading toward Jerusalem. He wants to be there uh, on the day of Pentecost. So let's read on now about the account in Ephesus. We went on ahead to the ship and sailed for Asos, where we were going to take Paul aboard. He had made this arrangement because he was going there on foot. When he met us at Asos, we took him aboard and went on to Mytilene. The next day, we set sail from there and arrived at Chios. The day after that, we crossed over to Samos, and on the following day at Miletus. Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus to avoid spending time in the province of Asia, for he was in a hurry to reach Jerusalem, if possible, by the day of Pentecost. From Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus 
before the elders of the church. And when they arrived, he said to them, You know I have lived the whole time I was with you. From the first day I came into the province of Asia, served the Lord with great humility and with tears and in the midst of severe testing by the plots of my Jewish opponents. You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you but have taught you publicly and from house to house. I, I've i declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Now I know that none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. Therefore, I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of any of you, for I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he has bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years, I have never stopped warning each of you day and night with tears. Now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or needs or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. Remembering the words the Lord Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Well, as you consider Paul's statements, his parting words to the brothers and sisters and leaders of the church of Ephesus, what actions and attitudes had Paul practiced in his ministry that you believe are appropriate for leaders of your church? And to me, uh, I see a, an expression by Paul to serve God with humility, that you can expect persecution coming from somewhere, you don't know where, that we need to share the good news of our salvation with courage, that serving God isn't some secondary thing that we do. We need that serving God, to be faithful to him, that's got to be our number one priority. And then uh, one that, I, that captured me too in my study of this passage or this chapter of Acts 20 was that he, Paul supported his own ministry. Today I know there are many ministers that even those who are preaching some internationally and, and in working in different ministries, they are looking for the contributions from others to support them financially. And while, yes, that may be good, or they're out there working, but it shows something special that Paul regarded that if he's going to make a commitment, that he's going to find a way um, for the Holy Spirit to lead him to where he can support his own ministry rather than others supporting him. And what warnings? There were warnings that he also provided in this last statement to the leaders of the Ephesus church. 
that he gave, and one was to keep watch over yourself and the people that you oversee. Be a shepherd uh, of the body of Christ, and, and there's going to be people that are going to come in among your church to try to distort the truth, um, and they will attempt to draw people away uh, from the church. So be on guard is Paul's warning. Um, and then in verse 36, continuing on there, when Paul had finished speaking, he knelt down with all of them and prayed. They all wept as they embraced him and kissed him. What grieved them the most was his statement that they would never see his face again. Then they accompanied him to the ship. It had to be emotional. Paul had been there at the church in Ephesus, I believe, longer than any other location in his ministry. He had been there for three years. Uh, and so he was a close brother and sister. Um, there, those leaders uh, had to be uh, Aquila and Priscilla, who I think were probably leaders in that church, were there, several others. Um, and Paul again, disclosed to them that he would not be there again. Um, so you can see that from that description that a very close relationship among brothers and sisters that he has at that church. What about your church? Or I should say, what about your relationship with the church you attend? with the leaders. Is that a close relationship? I found that having, my wife and I having been members of other rural churches, that has been the case, whether we've been in a leadership position or just attending and participating. Uh, but we felt a strong love relationship and even medium-sized churches, we felt the same. And I, I really sense that's a confirmation many times of where um, not just um, certainly if it's a Bible-based church, but you sense the love from brothers and sisters in Christ. And it's, um, it's wonderful to have that kind of relationship because if the opposite is true, uh, if there's dissension among church leaders, it's unlikely that church membership will be on board to sharing the gospel message, to be faithful to God's instructions in the Word of God. You know, I hope that you continue to be touched by this book of Acts. The work of the Holy Spirit is just incredible. Uh, as I've mentioned before, to me it could be called the Acts of the Holy Spirit so powerful and to see Paul and the other uh, leaders in the early Christian church their commitment to serving God faithfully it's got to be a wake-up call for us in these days we those of us living in America particularly we're blessed with conveniences um, uh, and, and such a convenient lifestyle that we live. Um, our needs uh, are so few compared to so most people living on the planet. And it, it seems to me that we just have our priorities mixed up. We think being comfortable is our number one priority all the time. And we learn from this book of Acts of the Apostles that our priority is serving the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that you continue to be touched by the Holy Spirit, that you're led by him, um, that you hear his voice and you hear his application. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.